Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the Mutual Aid Rethinking Charity discussion. Oh, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay, so thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for folks joining us today uh, for the Mutual Aid uh, Rethinking Charity discussion. Um, I'm excited we have an esteemed panel today, uh, folks who have been doing this work for a while in a variety of different sectors. Uh, first off, we have David Adams, who's the executive director of the William Casper Graustein Memorial Fund. Uh, he spent his early career as an attorney and over the last 20 years, he has served in various nonprofit management positions, including executive director of Associated Black Charities and vice president of the New York Urban League. Uh, we also have Jorge Diaz Ortiz, an artist, co founder, and director of Edit Arte, an organization of working class artists and cultural workers in community arts, media, and mutual aid efforts, currently based in Puerto Rico. And Sarana Nia, who's having some technical difficulties and will be with us in a moment, uh, is the co founder of Mutual Aid Hartford, based in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, they have over 15 years of experience engaging young people and embodied healing, justice work, and organizing. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Super excited for this conversation. Uh, my name is Onyeka Obiacha, and I am the Managing Director of the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. Um, and I'm really excited to engage in this conversation. Okay, we have Sarana back, which is super exciting. Thank you for returning. Can imagine doing this without you. Uh, so, just a, a conversation on networking and, and Q&A. So following this panel, all attendees are invited to join a 30 minute informal networking session to continue the conversation and get engaged with fellow attendees. Uh, the link to this session is in the description below. And we will also share the link in the chat at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, this informal networking opportunity will take place in a separate session window that's not recorded and we're up to 20 people can share their video. So really excited to see you all and engage in further conversation. Uh, we will devote the last 25 minutes of the day's session to Q&A, and we invite you to share any questions you have for the panelists using the chat function. Uh, we also encourage you to use the clapping feature in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen to engage with the panel. Any questions, comments, concerns, compliments you have, we're excited to engage with you all today. So uh, let's just start it off. Um, Sarana, Jorge, this is directed to you. Uh, while many are familiar with mutual aid, for some, this actually might be a new idea. So to begin the conversation, Sarana, can you kick us off? It'll be helpful to ensure that we're on the same page and have a firm understanding of the practice and politics of mutual aid. So all that to say, how would you define mutual aid and what is your involvement with the practice of mutual aid? Cool, no pressure, huh? Well, hey y'all. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm Sarana or Ra. Um, super uh, excited, uh, humbled to be here. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't think I hold the definition of mutual aid. I can tell you some values that I I think are important and what makes it special to me. You know, other terms that I've used to talk about mutual aid are community care right? Networks of care. Um, I think that mutual aid can <laughs> be defined as like anti-racism in action, right? It is like all of our frameworks in action to me. It's abolition in action, it's equity in action. Um, and so in that way, it kind of just operationalizes all these things that we're always um, talking about. I see mutual aid as a network that can make organizing and power building possible, right? So just mutual aid as a value, as a, a collective care value is something I think we're still like exploring in the collective consciousness, right? And it's really in the forefront right now. The way I define and think of mutual aid and differentiate it for some other, um, kind of forms of harm reduction are that it actually is to build power. So we believe that building communities of care, we believe that building networks of care actually builds community power. 
Thank you. Uh, Jorge? Yes. Uh, thank you, Sarana. I saw that you already did the work. I don't have to say anything else. She said it. <laughs> uh, I guess it would make more sense to speak about, like, why we started mutual aid, like why we even encountered, uh, it was after Huracan Maria here in Puerto Rico. Um, and the foundations of it really were the, the solidarity and frontline work we were doing. Um, so like, like, we, like I've mentioned to you all in the conversation before, like mutual aid, the, 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 you know, can be defined very different depending on politically where you're at. And I'm glad Saranat is grounding us in the kind of practice that we are about, um, you know, so, um, you know, as, as, as a Puerto Rican, as, uh, as a person from a colony, a colonized person, who has, has always been engaged in collective struggle um, for the liberation of, a uh, collective liberation of, of all the people that live here and also in, in the U.S. understanding our relationship, close relationship to other folks in the U.S. who go to similar struggles. So our, our work of mutual aid came directly from those relationships that we built for years of so frontline work with the black folk, with the queer LGBTQ folks um, in parts of the South and the East Coast in other areas um, through the work we did of a book that we wrote, we co-authored called When We Fight, We Win. So out of that came those relationships. And as soon as the hurricane hit us, we were in, we're in Santurce, so we're like real close to the airport. And we have a lot of links to a lot of different community groups locally. So we became a distribution center. Like it just, we just took on a challenge and it was actually our people, some comedores sociales, big ups to them, do incredible work. Um, they started the first, you know, in terms of the frontline work, right? of the work that we did and and we eventually had about 13 centers that collectively folks were supporting and getting resources mostly from diaspora folks that you know that committed uh to making that that effort um and um and, and, it, and it was and, and it was difficult and i guess we'll talk a little bit about that later uh but yeah i would say that that's our contact but for us as a working class organization uh, that does cultural work for us all work produces culture so the most fundamental the food the community is it's it's what we're about and it, it you know, we people had known us for years as a theater group, as a visual art group. Yeah, that, that's what we could do. But it wasn't until the hurricane that we could actually take on seriously doing the kind of mutual aid work that we would have done for years if we would have had the resources. So that's what we call ourselves a working class cultural organization because we believe in the totality of the work, but sometimes we have to silo specifically because of philanthropy, right? And do certain parts of the work that we can fund um, as we do the other ones, just like we've always done in community at a different capacity. Thank you so much for that. And I, I, we're going to pull that thread a little bit more doing work that can be funded and, you know, excited to loop David into that situation, that conversation as it comes up. But before that, let's still continue to define this work because again, mutual aid, although it's been around in a variety of forms and a variety of places and history and indigenous populations for years, for centuries even, we're still coming as a Western culture post COVID, still coming to this with a different lens that I think let's really continue to ground. So Jorge, starting with you and then and Ra, feel free to answer as well. Let, what distinguishes mutual aid from charity work? Yeah, um, and, and I, I guess my question would be at the level of the ground or at the level of philanthropy at the level of the nonprofit work, that would be my clarification, that would ask you for clarification, which, at what level? Let's do all levels, let's do all levels. Okay. Well, at the level of the ground, when you're, when you're handing out food, when you're giving stuff to people, really that question comes up something internally. If you're not a social service organization, like we're trying to do solidarity work, we're trying to build. And that was something that we proposed from the beginning, you know, to different levels of success. But certainly in most of the centers, there was workshops trying to get people to learn different skills that they could use during the hurricane, how to purify water, how to, how to uh, grow uh, germinados, I'm sorry. Um, missing the word in, in English, other uh, agricultura, agricultura, you know, workshops that we had. So, so at that level, we had the question from the beginning, this is about charities, about building the power of community, you know, and building powers, the ability to do things, the ability to get the resources on the ground. At the level of foundation, at the level of the nonprofit work, I think that's a very different meaning because I think foundations are very much structured under the charity model, right? Structure under this model of charity that can't seem to get out of for the most part. Some make an attempt, different places where they're sitting, struggling with it. But certainly if we are to have, to make the shifts that we need to do in the moment in time that we are, and if we believe in it and that we need to have transformation in society, foundations have to shift from a diff to a different paradigm that is a paradigm of mutual aid. And there is specific practices that can be done that are being done that could shift that, you know? Um, 
but certainly that is, I think, the difference. There is a different level of solidarity uh, and the attitude is different when you're building at the same level with other organizations and groups, regardless of difference, but you're on the same ground when you're building mutual aid and solidarity. Yeah, yeah, I really agree with all of that, Jorge. Um, you know, I think for me, mutual aid is differentiated specifically from charity in its intentions and or origins, like, you know, kind of to what you're saying, Jorge, it's inherent indigenous African technologies, people who lived and survived in earth-based practices, right? Like caring for each other is an earth-based practice, right? It's an act of bravery, of courage, of equity, right? Um, and so creating a, a network to make that happen is where mutual aid is valid as organizing to me, right? And so as a trained organizer, that's a natural link for me in terms of honoring and holding humanity and needs versus just like exploiting marginalized identities to pat ourselves on the back, right? And so I think talking about it is, is difficult because it really depends on how things are operationalized. But one thing I really want to highlight that that you uh, said, Jorge, is this what makes mutual aid different is yes, the collective, the focus on the collective, but the adaptability, mutual aid's ability to adapt and transform with the community, with the collective, Right, we're going through and doing a bunch of follow up phone calls right now with folks in our mutual aid Hartford network, and we aren't so much narrating as we are asking. Right, what what is happening? What do you need? We have ideas from our collective of core individuals doing the work, but that larger collective, that co creation, um, that adaptability, that that friction and movement, that that's what bucks at the status quo and things like charity maintain it in a sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I, I like this idea of really providing opportunities to build community power. I think that's really the root of mutual aid and understanding that Serana, to your point, it's we are directly responsible for the needs of our community and we don't have a top-down approach of saying, hey, here's what we read at Yale, so this is what we're gonna do for y'all. And if that's actually not the case, it's you all approximate to the issues. So how do we give you all the resources and work together for you to provide your neighbors the resources to be successful? Um, so I appreciate that. Um, David, to you, you know, Graustein, this past week y'all gave a million dollar grant for Movement for Black Lives. You funded mutual aid organizations. From your philanthropic view, what do you see about organizations like Mutual Aid Hartford, organizations like the mutual aid movement in general? What do you see, what attracted you to things like this from a philanthropic lens? So, so first I have to be honest and say that we did not sort of go out looking for mutual aid work to support. And we're frankly, you know, quite ignorant of it. Uh, but because we had really shifted when we adopted our mission, um, new mission five years ago, away from the charity perspective and, and much more focus on supporting communities trying to build power for themselves, that we learned about mutual aid in that space. And that the people who were really focused on building community power were the ones that you know began to educate us about mutual aid, the potential for mutual aid. And so really what attracted us to it was the fact that it was more than just sort of providing some goods and services in community because it was really the community continuing to lead the effort and continuing to build power. And we really saw the overlap of the mutual aid work that was emerging in our site. It had been there all along, but we just had not really been paying attention to it. But the people that were you know, doing community organizing, building community power, were you know, sort of educating us that this was another way to address needs while continuing to look at what kinds of systemic changes needed to be focused on. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And you know, also thinking about this idea of kind of mutual aid community power and a lot of mutual aid organizations I've seen have stemmed from 
the multiple pandemics, right, that we've seen going on right now has stemmed from a need for peer-to-peer -peer community support, which is, seems like um, a disaster response framework. How do we take the mutual aid framework past the COVID-19 pandemic, past a lot of um, uh, actions and program that's been a response to the assassination of George Floyd? How do we think about really creating a sustainable framework past this moment and this time? Who do you want what? to start that? No, I... Yeah, anyone, please, open question. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, we obviously listen to the leaders on the ground. That's what's most important to us. Um, and, and you know, seeing who's focusing on, on finding solutions and, and is really bringing community together to figure that out, to engage in that kind of problem solving. And that's what we want to support. For us, uh, it, it's really been about resourcing. Last year, we, we realized that we couldn't wait for the next catastrophe to have a mutual aid program. It had to be an ongoing program, raise it from the level to project program. And we try to raise very, very hard. Like the money that we got from Maria ran out three months, four months, people were still without electricity and we already had no resources to take care of the situation, right? The money for the earthquakes came too, came too late. Um, you know, the COVID-19 just flipped everything on us and it was even hard to get, you know, to even have the communication. We lost a lot of communication during that time with philanthropy and other folks because everybody just hadn't, wasn't ready for the moment. So I think that it's not the only answer, right? Because the work has to be done, but resourcing has been the main issue for us in order to be able to have a program because folks are not ready for the next hurricane because anybody just to the other, to the other. So nobody has the resources to do what's, what even, to even do this, to even do a conference at the level of Puerto Rico, like let's come together. Like the, there's no resources to think about the work and to really push it because everybody just still doing the work, doing the work, doing the work and understaffed. So I think it has to be at a different level if we really want to take this. I mean, right since we're at the philanthropic conference, if I was at the organizing conference, we would talk about organizing, right? But at the philanthropic conference, I think we have to be clear about that. This work is not resource at the level, right? If if we're changing, if foundations are changing priorities every year, or just giving twenty thousand dollars here, and in two years maybe maybe you can apply again. Maybe not because you already got money. Oh, you know, all these situations that make it so difficult for the work to happen. Um, and, and then because they know, the states know, the philanthropists know that, that the mutual aid projects are the ones that are successful and responding quickly. Even FEMA knows it. You know, we are the quickest to respond because we have the networks that we have. I mean, even if we don't have the capacity economically, we have the relationship with the networks. So the work will happen at the level that it can. And if it's not funded, we're going to, you know, we're going to survive. We're going to do it at that level as well. But if we want to see it thrive, it needs some serious uh, thinking about how to really resource it. Hundred um, percent. You know, if we want to build strong organizations, we want to sustain a movement. Uh, we have to be as mutual aid work. We have to be able to invest in th that leadership and the leadership development of our people ongoing doing this work and also that basic needs support. You know, if you're, I think again, what makes mutual aid so special and why it also challenges philanthropy is because of that adaptability, changeability and transformational nature. Um, but we're, I'll say for Mutual Aid Hartford, we're kind of living into this tension right now where we're struggling to hold that long-term vision of committing, creating, you know, right now we have a partnership where we have a call line and a helpline um, for those experiencing uh, personal crisis. Um, it's staffed by social workers. It's anonymous, right? You can get this, um, kind of mental health support if you need it. It's called a social support network. But ultimately the long-term goal is to actually train a cohort of people in the field that are available to respond, right? To either uh, interpersonal conflict, organizational conflict, uh, mitigate you know instances of harm and abuse, intervene, right? Um, 
but we're having a hard time being able to sustain resourcing our people to do that because we do believe in paying people, paying a living wage, which is 28 to $30 an hour in Connecticut, right? So paying people well to also be able to coordinate some of this work that's on behalf of hundreds of people. And then also balancing that with trying to fundraise enough to meet all of the material need. You know, some of the ways that we've done that is um, to try to create this community fund that's always community fundraised and always raised through non-grants, right? So we have a steady stream of money coming in that always goes out to emergencies um, in the community. Um, but it's been a challenge, I'll just say quite honestly, we're not being uh, resourced to resource our people to do this well or to resource as many people as we want at the level that we want. When we know about the eviction crisis happening, when we know people are owing $6,000 in back rent and we're calling saying, hey, we can offer 250 in food at least or 250 for whatever you need, right? We're doing a lot of direct cash assistance. Um, for food support or supplies or whatever folks need, but it's just attention. It, it's it's very hard. So, you know, when thinking about the future of mutual aid as not just um, kind of a, a a pandemic response framework, this idea of being well resourced keeps coming up again and again. Rightfully so. So, what does a well resourced mutual aid organization, I feel like I know what they do, but how do we go from the current low resource environment with philanthropy to the resources that you all need? What does that framework, like if you can talk to some of the philanthropists online right now, how could they change to help you all get the resources you all need to be successful? Or hey, Sarana. Right, there's many, there's many uh, layers to this question, and I've had the same question for philanthropy. What does it take for philanthropy to really step up? What is it going to take? I mean, or are we going to continue the same level of just giving out five percent and you know, and keeping all those resources, and all your distribution of wealth, you know, minimal given to folks? Um, I'm sorry, my dumb is barking. <laughs> um, so, um, but there are particular social. For example, right, this year during COVID, we formed the Southern Power Fund. The Southern Power Fund is a group of different organizations from the South, which is the largest partner of the United States and the least resource, right? About 5% of foundation dollars go to the South of the United States. Um, and of course, where a lot of the, even people are interested in politics, where a lot of the stuff went down that changed the political spectrum that were, you know, or shifted or whatever at level we can, you know, we'll see what happens kind of. But, but what shifted was those communities, right? It was those communities in North Carolina, those communities in Georgia. So the Southern Power Fund Fund, uh, got together, Highlander, Alternate Roots, uh, uh, ourselves, uh, um, other groups, are, um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking quick. A lot of you, you can look them up, Southern Power Fund. A lot of different crises have been working together for years, Southern, make, Southern uh, Grant Makers for Southern Progress, and basically came together and, and did the challenge to philanthropy, doing the donor organizing work, like give unrestricted, give to us, we're trying to raise $10 million in six months, and it happened. And we distributed four million of that to base organizations on the ground throughout the South, four million already, and we're ready to do another four million, which means 100 organizations get $40,000. They don't have to fill out a single thing. It's based on the work they've been doing and the people that know have been seeing the work, they have to fill out minimal, no reporting, and, and that's the type. And I know most foundations might cringe at hearing that and not ready to do that, but the conversations have to, have to start about how far are you all willing to go to shift this, you know? Um, and that's uh, because the accountability of the philanthropy has no accountability to the sector, right? It's the accountability you set up for yourselves, but the accountability has to be established and that can only happen if there's an agreement to make a shift in how money is given and who is given. Look, when we had the hurricane, we did a map of all the different groups that were doing work on the ground. Some of them, most of them didn't have 501c3s. Most of them didn't have corporations. Some of them were just emails like PayPal accounts. And, 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 and so many people gave and they could give and you could see that they could get a lot of people were like really conscious that we can't do this. How can we give to this group? Really like having a really difficult time. 
you know, and um, and in the end, the word proved to work. So there's a lot of trust that has to be involved. And I don't know how that leap of trust happens when there's not the relationship, especially when philanthropy is so a lot of most of the time, right? Not all philanthropy, so separated from the community organizations or the communities that that trust to build it has to be a big leap of trust in what's happening on the ground. And that's a commitment that has to come from the other side as we continue to do the work. Yeah, uh, I just think that the biggest um, misalignment I see, right, is like funding in streams or amounts or in cycles that <laughs> to organizations or people or groups trying to <laughs> offer uh, a um, another option to like exploitation, right? And all this violence, but we're being exploited <laughs> and violated also, right? In those, as we're trying to do this work. And so one of the, you know, uh, Jorge already hit on so much of it, you know, organizing philanthropy, that's really crucial work. I, I love the things that I'm seeing um, in that realm, uh, which is new to me, trying to understand that. And then also, um, you know, just multi-year funding cycles too. Like, please stop asking me to prove what I accomplished in a year when we talk all the time about how this is relationship building work. This is, right, don't give me half and then I gotta give you a report in six months about what, when we know, especially in crisis time, like especially right now, you know, like those unrestricted funds, those multi-year funds, right? Invest in leadership development of folks doing this work. We know it takes years. And we know folks often engage in this work are barely meeting their own basic needs. So we have to make sure that we're showing up fully to make sure that the people doing the work are resourced well and well. And some of the conversation that I've had with philanthropy over the years is like, we are resourcing specifically, you know, my field, it tends to be organizing. So like we are funding organizing without resourcing it. And by mm. not putting resources around all of those um, adjacent uh, fields, right? The mental health support work, the conflict resolution work, right? The abuse intervention work, the right? Where folks are needing like their person affirmed and, and um, just creating safety for folks, creating the conditions that folks can continue to do their work. Like that cycle is exploiting our best and brightest just so quickly. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And, and, and David, Jorge touched on something that I, I wanna bring to you, this idea of, you know, a lot of people on the ground and a lot of organizations, maybe just an email address probably isn't incorporated as a 501c3. So from looking at your view of a grant maker, did Graustein have to make any changes in order to deploy money to those type of organizations? Because I love the idea of kind of building power on the ground and it just, whoever's doing the work, we should fund them and resource them well. From the, from the grant making side, what does that look like in terms of processes? Like if, you know, I worked at XYZ Foundation, what are some things that I could do to be better to, pe to provide opportunities for people like Jorge and Serana to get the resources they need? So, so I think Serana touched on the really key issue in terms of relationship building, because, you know, it's really not that important, you know, sort of what the structures of these organizations are, because there's always a workaround to make sure that the grant making can happen, right? And frankly, before we even waded into the mutual aid space, we had already begun to shift and adapt, you know, because we were supporting people doing community organizing, that did not have and sometimes did not want to have 501c3 structures. And so we've really begun the process of trying to build up the intermediary space so that there is infrastructure to support these entities that does not burden them. And that's taking time. It's not something that has been in, in, in place. Uh, it was really under-resourced and we're really trying to partner with and learn from you know, the, the people on the ground, the intermediaries, how that works best. Um, and it really is about that relationship building, that listening and learning from so that we can be as responsive and adaptive as we can in, in the process. 
Um, but, you know, I feel like we've taken some strides forward so that, you know, when there are groups that are on the ground doing the work, we're not burdening them with, you know, having to go through all these, you know, hoops of creating a 501c3 such that, you know, we can put them in, in, in contact with the groups that we know can facilitate those funds, those resources flowing where they need to go. Mm, mm, mm. And to, the, to that point, a, a question just popped up from the audience q and um, Thank you, audience. Please continue to send in these questions. How do you make potential funders aware of the work on the ground, right? This disconnect in the relationship building, how, I mean, you know, Yale, Ivory Tower, I don't know the, the equivalent of a foundation tower or a foundation kind of walls, but for folks, how do you, how do potential funders, how do they, how do they uh, create relationships and how can they be made aware of the work that they're doing on the ground? David, I would love to start with you again and, you know, Jorge and Serrano, feel free to, to add context from your point of view. Well, I mean, you have to get out of the field. You can't do it from your office. You know, you can't do it on the phone and, and through email. You actually do have to go out and meet with people and see where they're at, you know, meet people where they are and see what's going on um, and be accessible, be available. Um, and even, you know, when we try to do our periodic sort of visits, we're always trying to understand, you know, how to do it in a way that works for the groups themselves. We try not to have this sort of uh, template that says, well, you have to, you know, have these people available and, and present these kinds of, you know, presentations or anything. It really is a, a mutual process. So, you know, it, it is about getting out and, and connecting with people as much as possible so that you can learn both in real time and in real situations, you know, because, mm. you know, having people come to your office is going to inevitably create an artificial situation, an artificial relationship, and you're not going to really learn in the process. Mm, mm, thank you. Jorge, Ra, anything to add to that? The question was, how can funders learn about the work that's happening on the ground? Yeah. I think right now, some of the most important things to me are to understand that all work is happening in some sort of network, right? To really be looking at the landscape and how things and efforts are collaborating or not, right? And trying to understand that web of interlocking work is what is really important to me right now. Um, I think having a a view, a, an understanding of what power building is, making mm. that a value, right? Having some mm. real clarity around um, not continuing to <laughs> kind of further marginalize and dehumanize um, efforts that BIPOC folks are making but really live into what are the values, where are we seeing connection? Um, and I absolutely like visiting, going and seeing what is happening, being in the spaces, if it's possible. Um, I always operate on a premise like truth is not hard to come by. People just don't do the work to, to, to go, mm. go find it. Um, and so, the more people you talk to, the clearer picture you'll get. Just don't pick and choose who you want to be uh, speaking to and under getting understanding from. Mm. Jorge, anything to add to that? Okay. So also thinking about this work of mutual aid, right? Going back to the work that needs to be done. And to, to, to Ra's point, the network of people organizing and around this work of individuals, organizations. Um, another question from audience Q&A, what role can or should government play in mutual aid? Are there things that government should still be held accountable for versus communities providing for their own needs? I have a bunch of thoughts on this, but as always, would love to defer to y'all to see what y'all think. And anyone can take it. I mean, definitely. No, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Please, please. 
Okay, I'll be brief. Um, uh, now I lost it. Wait. <laughs> I mean, we can't let a government off the hook, of course. I think that's, I think everybody, you know, nobody, I think it's, wants to take the place of the government. I mean, right? But also, we have to build our structures. And us as a working class organization, we understand if we're going to build power, we have to build organizations. And we have to build the networks. And we have to do that kind of work. And it's the only way, you know, not to get all historical, but that's how the bourgeoisie got to power and, you know, and eventually turned what capitalism was. If we're going to go to a post-capitalism world, we're going to have to organize seriously on the ground. So, so that the mutual aid work is going to have to happen. If the government does more, then we can focus on other types of mutual aid work. But if the government is just completely abandoned and completely failing, then we're going to be, mutual aid will be <laughs> the, 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 the only frame we're going to be focusing on. But sure, we won't let them off the hook. And that's a lot of the work we do is pressing government, is doing work here, anti-colonial work in Puerto Rico, and against the fiscal control board, which is set up by the U.S. and controls the islands. I mean, I, I think government's going to get the most authentic feedback, you know, from the community itself and, and mutual aid networks are really some of the places to get that authentic feedback. You know, unfortunately, the, the way that government has constructed its relationship with nonprofits, it does not sort of support the, the most authentic flow of information. OK. And so to really understand whether you're getting to the, the real problems and addressing those problems, you oftentimes, you know, have to then go around the, the nonprofit industrial complex and really get back on the ground and find out from the people who are, are really right there on the ground connected to those folks to find out, is it working? Is it happening? Are there, are there people falling through the cracks? And if so, why? Because a lot of the mutual aid work really does come into existence because so many people fall through the cracks and and therefore you know it's really a symptom of the fact that you know government's not doing its job the nonprofit industrial complex is not doing its job and the only way that you can know that is to be in touch with those networks on the ground mm. I think that um, one thing I just want to mention is that regardless of even when the government does do its job, the bureaucracy around it just right makes it totally inaccessible for folks. That's why people are coming to the mutual aid networks because we're not putting people through so many hoops. But I just want to ground this uh, question in the reality that when the pandemic hit, the government was coming to mutual aid networks for help. I had at one point, Oni, I don't know if you remember this, but I made a status about everybody that had come to the mutual aid network for assistance. Entire districts in Connecticut, the children's hospital. I, in one of, uh, we had the Navy asking for PPE. Like it was wild. So that the government is not set up to be the government, right? They, they, they were coming to us to say help. You're clearly because we operate outside of that bureaucracy, right? And even they could see that we were getting things done mm. faster. So mm. I just think that's really important to remind us all of what happened there. And that, the list was much more extensive, but in short, that's showing you, right? And so people are coming to the mutual aid networks because there's just so much less process and we're not we're not asking folks to um, give us tedious amounts of information. You don't have to divulge. It's an honor system, right? To this point of trust, like I trust you. I trust that you need what you're asking for. I'm not gonna ask you for papers. I'm not gonna, right? We're not gonna do all that. And we've had people take us to task a little bit about that. What about background checks? What about, and so to David's point, a lot of the work thus far has been pushing what the values are of mutual aid, right? What we're going to stay grounded in with our people. And part of that is trust in our people. And so mm. government would have mm. to shift so much <laughs> in its frameworks and in its operations uh, to be able to meet some of that gap of why folks are coming to mutual aid networks as well, because it's mm. safer. Mm. Mm. And and Rock, can we can we I, I remember that said us, I remember you and I talked a lot about that. Can you actually continue with that story? Because I think it's so powerful 
when we talked about it, you know, when entire towns were coming to you and say, hey, can you set up mutual aid where mm -hmm. we are? What was your response to them? I think you should share that because I think that goes to show how folks are thinking about mutual aid, yeah. this idea of community. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So in short, you know, my response was no. <laughs> um, but we are happy, right? Because it, it's mutual aid, right? I'm not, we, we were talking about moms before the call started and we joke, like we're just the moms that started this. And David, you on the call, you said moms get it done, right? And so we made that, we, right? And that's really, um, it was able to take off and be successful because of our deep organizing and community connection and relationship work, right? Prior. So even though it looks like it was just this big surge all of a sudden because of COVID-19, that was due to the work that existed previously. And so what I told, um, schools, family centers, uh, school districts was, no, I can't do that for you, but I'm happy to offer mentorship and guidance along the way as you build out a mutual aid network for the town of Windsor, for this family center, for this school, right? Because the idea is not for us to hold it. I don't, I don't know that town like you do, right? And somebody in that town is already doing mutual aid, so find that. Mm. Right. Find them, find that church, find that family center, find that auntie, find, right? Because it, it already mm -hmm. exists, right? And so a lot of the mutual aid work, again, to me, a major component of the mutual aid work is the synergizing, the collaboration, right? It's not competitive, right? Um, and so, yeah, in short, that's that's what I told them. I think that's what you are referring to, Oni. But, you know, and so we've seen that happen. We've seen where that push, right? And now for, I have actually some meetings that are still on my calendar <laughs> from helping folks kind of get that rolling and now they have a group, right? Yeah, and a, a, a question from the Q&A that I think you, you just answered I'm going to summarize it for the answer and we'll move on to another question. How do you envision scaling up mutual aid? Community context slash engagement is crucial mutual aid, but how do we support people and communities on a larger scale? And I think what we're saying here is that it's not about scaling up. It's about replicating the process of building power within your own communities. So mutual aid Hartford, you know, speaking for Ra, and please, as always, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not here to serve Connecticut or the, we're here to serve Hartford. And then Mutual Aid New Haven can serve New Haven, Mutual Aid Windsor can serve Windsor. And even within that, there could be mutual aid organizations on the neighborhood level that are serving their neighbors in the way that it needs to be served. So I think oftentimes, you know, this idea of scaling and like, no, we're operating at a neighborhood level and it's about depth rather than ge geographic breadth. Um, but going to the, to the next question, that this idea about um, leaders and providing opportunities for people to start their own, you know, another question from the audience was, and David, I, I would love for you to answer, and obviously Jorge and Rod jump in as needed, would it be helpful to create pipelines for folks with lived experience doing great work on the ground into roles working in philanthropy and or on foundation boards? Uh, David, do you have any thoughts about that? Lived experience leaders within the philanthropic world? Yes, with the proviso that you're not having the creation coming from the top down. Okay. And, you know, it really does have to be something that's coming from the ground up. And, you know, part of why we feel good about the intermediaries that we have been able to support is that the people running those are people from community, community organizers who understand the challenges that they face themselves, you know, in their own roles, you know, in their groups. And so when they construct those networks and pipelines, they're doing it um, informed by the lived experience. You know, too often, um, you know, philanthropy and, and other entities want to create opportunities that, you know, then really become sort of places where philanthropy can, you know, sort of learn and kind of create showcases, but don't necessarily meet the needs on the ground. Hmm. Ra, Jorge, anything to add to that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I don't know. First thing is don't take our organizers. We need the organizers on the ground. 
that that would be my first thing. No, and I'm mm-hmm. saying it actually because I know a lot of French organizers go to foundation jobs eventually because they pay better, they have more, you know, they have more benefits, and they do great jobs. But the question and the conversations that we still have, people of color and my, li- I'm not talking about my, my light skin ass. I'm talking about all the people that I know, black folk, BP, IPOC in the U.S. Telling me the frustration that it is because the power is still held at the top. And again, it's a generalization. I know practically people that are doing really good work in some foundations, but the general environment and, the, and what we hear over and over again is that the power is still at the top. So yes, it's better than, of course it's better than, but also again, I like the idea of uh, David about intermediaries. You know, like I'm really incredibly impressed about what the Southern Power, and I'm sure there's other groups like the Southern Power Fund doing similar work. And we've been able, because there's all this knowledge in this room, you know? So I, David, to your point, I think that's a great idea. We don't always have to only bring them into the organizations, but there's other ways to do that work, which still, uh, you know, allows people to stay at what they're doing and supports that that work. Which, to the point of scaling up, if we can't even resource the work, how are we going to scale up? I have no problem with having questions on scaling up from the bottom up. But if we can't resource it, if we have 13 centers and now maybe we have four or five struggling, then it's not about scaling up. It's how do we sustain as we think of growing and the possibility of scaling up? Mm. Mm. Can you repeat Ra? the question, Omi? So this idea of getting pipelines oh. for folks with lived yeah. experience to be in philanthropy or foundation boards? Um, So I I do know of some of that work happening already. Um, And it is a balance because to Jorge's point, we already have the organizers, the folks like being really exploited, (laughs) right? Being pulled in way too many directions. So I'll just say that's why we have a value to resource our organizers well and that means not overworking that means hours a week right that they're working and that means pay wage um and so it's kind of unheard of uh for a brand new organization to be offering you know no less than 25 dollar an hour really averaging more than a 28 to 30 dollar an hour uh hourly for organizing work, right? You don't really see that unless it is some really high up admin or, but our value is to resource organizers well in their organizing work. If they are, you know, I think this speaks to the point again of like the whole ecosystem of the organizing work and how just like the organizing in a specific lane gets extracted out and funded. And it's totally making the ecosystem fall apart. Well, I'm watching it across the field, specific to Connecticut, and I'm sure a larger view than mine sees it, right? So now I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but um, it's just so important that we remember everything is a debit and a deficit. If we want to put something on an organizer's plate, on a lived person with lived experiences plate, what are you removing so that you are not debiting and exploiting that person constantly, then patting yourself on the back to say, oh, look, marginalized people are leading. I don't believe in that. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And and Ra, I, I, I am a huge fan of tangents. So let's continue to have a conversation about like the ecosystem, how that's looking at, at least in Connecticut, how that's breaking down. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I saw some aggressive head nods from Jorge. So I would love to follow that. Love to follow oh, that trail. Oni, this is like. Um, I know, yeah. we talk about it all the time. So, you know, right now and to the point of what philanthropy can do, we are not being resourced to build strong organizations. And I'll just say, you know, 35, 45, even 55,000 a pop, that doesn't resource a human being to be well in their work, to balance a work and home life, to, um, to right, get training, right because we need to resource our folks this work is exhausting it's emotional it's triggering 
right? To this point of like the ecosystem where we defined organizing as this one piece. I, I had a crisis of a identity when I got here because I realized that organizing in Connecticut means um, legislative and policy work. So a long time as someone mm. oriented towards mutual aid work, I was like, I don't even know, right? But I think that, um, I, sorry, Oni, tell me again. What, oh yeah, just like this idea of how we're resourcing folks and the amount of money we're being given to like hire folks to do this crucial work. It's world building work. We're saying like you're building the world. The weight of the world is on black women's shoulders. The weight of the world is on marginalized folks. Folks are silenced, folks are, and then, we're being given such small amounts of currency to resource folks properly to be able to show up well, to be able to show up fully, to be able to show up consistently. And it's hurting, it's harming us because we're not able to build strong organizations that way. And so if we cannot build an organization that outlasts us, if I cannot build a team, look at, here's my team behind me, y'all. I'm leaving, right? I'm supposed to be planning for my exit. And if I'm only getting money to hire one person to keep the bare minimum afloat to do, that's, come on now. We know that's not how you resource a movement. We know that's not how you resource an organization, right? I don't know, I'll stop. Cause I obviously, I feel emotionally because I'm watching a lot of, collapse in the field right now. I'm watching how it creates conflict between us, between people that need to be working together. I'm watching the, the unwellness surface um, in some ways that we're taking out on each other. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, Jorge, anything to add to that about kind of ecosystem, how folks are working together, resources? So I think I'll hold because I think that was, I think if we have something else, I think we only have, we don't have much time. So I'd rather hold it, but thank you for asking me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Tom. Thank you for your words. Of I'm course. Sure. Yeah. David, and, and I think it relates to, to uh, one of the questions in the chat where someone is talking about, you know, how mutual aid work can be in tandem with rather than in opposition to. And I, I think it's a bit of a false narrative because we have to remember that there's a power equation here and who has the power. And so, you know, mutual aid is not working um, in opposition to. Mutual aid is filling gaps. It is dealing with the pieces of the ecosystem that are not working because of the failures of government and nonprofits and foundations. And so the real question is how can government nonprofits and foundations work in tandem with mutual aid work? Okay, and I think we have to turn that that around. I think you know Serrano was really touching on that because there's really insufficient support coming from those parts of the ecosystem to the mutual aid space. Yet, nonprofits, government, and foundations acknowledge the need because you know mutual aid would not exist if everything else was working so perfectly. And so I think we have to really sort of think about it in a very different way. Mm, thank you. And then David, two quick questions for you. Um, one, how can funders give to non 501c3s? Um, I know you talk a little bit about people. Right. So a quick basically, answer for there are organizations that serve as intermediaries. Um, and there's a, a, a whole answer about that in the chat from um, Malwin from our office. And, and we fund those intermediaries to be available to us to support and provide you know that kind of technical assistance to these groups, and so you know they exist everywhere I've ever been. I'm, I remember when I was doing work in New York City with the National Conference of Black Lawyers. One of the things that we did was provided that kind of intermediary service for community-based groups in Harlem and the rest of the city. And so it exists everywhere. You know, you certainly need to find them. Uh, unfortunately, the the intermediaries are. are in, in many ways, a lot like the mutual aid you know, system structures, they're not well resourced. They don't have the most highly visible networks. Um, and so it's really incumbent upon foundations. I mean, we had to do the work to reach out 
both to find them and to then determine, you know, do you have what you need in order to be able to provide that support? You know, not just to serve as a pass through, but to really provide back office support and to actually have the resources of your own to do that work. So um, it can be done. Uh, it does take additional work on, be on behalf of the foundation space. Let's help us know. And, and then one last one for you. Um, for folks in philanthropy, for grant makers, how do you convince, you know, someone's asking, how can I convince my colleagues to pay for salaries and personnel? People make programs happen. What suggestions do you have to change this on the philanthropic side to pay people what, they're, what they, they need to survive? Um, you know, I, I've always kind of had mixed feelings about the persuasion questions, okay? Because, you know, if you're in this space, mm. you know, if you're in philanthropy, you're in government, where by definition, you're supposed to be helping people, you're so also supposed to understand what the level of need is, okay? And then be committed to not perpetuating the problems, but really addressing those problems. And and so I I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you have some questions about whether or not uh, you should be paying for salaries and personnel, then I, it tells me that you're really not trying to help people. You know, that there's something else going on there, that you're engaged in some intellectual mm. exercise, frankly, but not really trying to problem solve. So I, I don't know if that's an, mm. a, a full answer to the question, but that's what it triggers for me. Mm. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, especially from the grant making side. Um, I'll say, okay, so we have about two minutes left or so. You know, again, there's about over 80 people on this call listening to us for the past hour or so. I'm sure based on the conversation, a lot of backgrounds, um, a lot of people in the room. So thank you all for joining to us, starting with Sorana and then Jorge and then David. What are some closing thoughts you have for people about mutual aid, about the work that you all are doing? You know, here at the 2021 Yale Philanthropy Conference, the title Reimagining Philanthropy, what notes do you have for folks? Yeah, I'll jump in because you know I, I I think they should have the last word anyway. I, I, I really do think that um, it is about listening and then figuring out you know what needs to change. You know we started with ourselves you know at the Grouseland Memorial Fund. We we you know kind of had to examine you know what parts of the traditions and legacy of philanthropy were we perpetuating and what did we have to let go of and, and shift? And that and that also then looks at, you know, what do we have to then be committed to changing in the ecosystem as well? You know, and there are parts of the ecosystem that are committed to equity, but unfortunately the overwhelming majority of the ecosystem is not. And we have to commit to then, you know, being a part of, you know, supporting efforts to make those changes as well. Um, and that includes changes in philanthropy, changes in policy, um, and and really probably the most important change is mindsets and, and how you think about, you know, who's really doing the work, who's really in touch with the problems, who's really um, committed to the people on the ground. So I'll stop there. Thank I think imagination only goes as far as the creativity or how in your mind is. So if you're going to reimagine philanthropy, I would have to ask folks where they're at, you know, and we need a transformation. We need a different paradigm. And honestly, harm reduction is great. We're going to keep fundraising, but we need to be start talking about wealth redistribution, about a future where philanthropies will work their way out of this business and that they start really giving like they want us to win and they want to transform the society because it affects all of us. And money hoarding is one of the greatest things that philanthropy has done. And it has to shift. It has to shift if, if the transformation that, you're, that has been talked about will even have a chance in this rapid acceleration of late stage capitalism. So it's an invitation and a challenge to really, really reimagine. And it's, it's hard, right? It's hard and it goes against the very foundations of philanthropy in a lot of ways, but not against the spirit of a lot of folks that for years, for decades, for generations have done the opposite within these structures that need to be re-examined, reshaped and eventually abolished. Uh, 
like going to church with you there for a second. I almost zoned out, Jorge. I was like, um, <laughs> I almost did come back. I was like, yes. Um, you know, so much to say. Um, I do want to say, uh, you know, some uh, Graustein in particular, Parent Family Foundation um, have been really open to listening to us on the mutual aid work um, and just living into not understanding and being honest about that, but showing up for the conversation. And I appreciate that. And more and more, that's what I value is everybody keeps showing up for the misunderstanding for the conflict, for the tension. The friction is how you make the change. Um, and so I'm appreciative of folks willing to get into that friction. The biggest thing for me is stop putting stuff, compartmentalizing stuff, right? The, the big value of Mutual Aid Hartford is that it's brave to make an offer. It's brave to, to uh, state a need, right? There's no hierarchy in that. And there's no hierarchy in the crisis response or sustainability work either. We need to resource them both, all of it, right? Um, and so really living into what those differentiations are and how to do both. It's not an option to choose one <laughs> um, is the biggest, the biggest thing. Uh, I guess that's on my mind right now. Um, in addition, just appreciating what folks already shared. <sighs> David, Jorge, Ra, appreciate y'all. Appreciate the work that you've been doing. Uh, for folks on the call, please scroll down to the summary section, uh, and then we're gonna hop into another uh, hop in chat uh, so we can continue this conversation. Um, again, David, Jorge, Ra, everyone on. Thank you so much for holding this space and being witnesses to everyone's truth here. I'll see you all in the breakout room. Thank you for moderating. Been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.